What's up everybody, it's Soren Baker here on Unique Access and today we're joined by Solo, aka Franklin, if you guys are into that Grand Theft Auto thing. Thank you for coming through, sir. See, you already know what it is, fam. You oh. call, I come. Yes, sir. I appreciate that, man. So, obviously, we're going to talk about Grand Theft Auto and Franklin, but, the, you know, I want to make sure that people understand your legacy in the game. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. being an artist, all your affiliations coming up, yeah. and being in movies, all this stuff. So, you know, for you, getting into the game, I was first really introduced to you through the Cube and the Cam affiliations yeah, and yeah. all that. But, like, how did you you know, get to where you were making records with them and getting to know them personally first? Well, Cam is like like family. We're not blood cousins, but you know how it is when you're kids, man. Right. You grow up with somebody that's your cousin or that's your brother, so, you know, he's like family, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we had a, a clique called What's Up Crew, man. It was right. a few of us, you know what I'm saying, that we was putting it down. We had some heavy heavy hitters as far mm -hmm. as, when I say heavy hitters, as far as the pocket-wise that was behind us, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And I used to always be like, man, Cam is hard, man. He was from Compton, you know, out of Carver Park, and I'm from Watts, you know. And um, we used to link up and hang out, and he used to be spitting. So I used to always be like, man, I got to get this dude on. So one day, man, you know, I used to run into Ice Cube. He's, uh, he had a Suzuki Jeep, and I had one. Mm -hmm. He had a gray one back in the days. He had Jerry Curl and everything, <laughs> and I ran into him. And I was like, oh, shit, that's dude from NWA. What's happening, homie? And he came off so cool that we ended up getting so cool that I was – on his porch with him at his mama house over there off of, I think it was Thoreau or something like that in 111 neighborhood. Oh, Van Wick maybe? Nah, it wasn't, it, it could have been Van Wick. Yeah, it was Van Wick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, you know, I knew I knew some of the, the, the 111s, you know. JD was a real 111, man. Mm -hmm. Man, free my dude JD, man. Yeah. JD was a real 111. You got Donuts, you got Ants, you got um, uh, Baby Mondo KK, you know what I'm saying? You know, I knew them dudes right there, so. Q wasn't active in the hood like that, but he was from over there and he knew everybody. So I used to always be telling him, man, I got this dude named Cam, man. He like mm -hmm. my cousin, he fired, man. You got to hear him, man. And he was <laughs> like, I will solo, you know, I will. So I kept being persistent with him, sitting on his front porch, man. I used to be having my, my son when he was a baby. Q used to be playing with him. We used to just be chopping it up. He used to be spitting stuff to me. Then one day he just came and said, man, I'm going to leave the NWA, start my own thing, man. I'm going to put Cam on, man. So... After that, you know, mm. he put Cam on. He stuck to his word. He started street knowledge right. over here off of Victoria, right off of Florence and, and stuff up in the up in a little industrial area. So, you know, I used to go up there with him and stuff. And he used to be like, man, I got this deal through East West. I'm going to put Cam on. So he did what he said. You know, he kept his word with me. And he put Cam on. Now, at that time, I thought he was putting us on. You know, he was <laughs> going to give me a contract, too. So I remember walking in there, and I was like, man, where my contract at, nigga? You know, I was game banging and in the streets real tough at that time, man. I was right. getting my money and I was with whatever anybody wanted to be with, man. I was a knucklehead. But um, he was like, Solo, it don't go like that. You know, they want to sign Cam. I was like, well, I'm going to be his DJ. I ain't no shit about DJing. <laughs> but one thing I, I, I can say on that note, man, Cube had told me, man, Solo, this is what you do, bro. You're going to be down with him. Don't worry about that. We're going to be good, bro. You right. my dude. Get you a SP-1200, some SP, some turntables, and get you this... um. They was making beats on it back then. Mm -hmm. I forgot the name of it. The Akai. Um, oh, yeah. The NPC. He was saying, go get you one, bro. I'm telling you, start doing beats. This was way back then. If I would have listened to this dude, I'd probably be a battle cat mm -hmm. or somebody by now because I knew music real good because I used to be doing it when I was a kid. Who didn't? You right, know, right. with Run DMC, scratching on turntables at your house with no mixer or no nothing. So, um... He put Cam on and did everything man, he's supposed to do, man. And then that's when I met DJ Pooh. I used to hear about DJ Pooh all the time, man. And um, Well, for you, too, like being around him when he said he was leaving NWA and then for him to actually leave NWA, yeah. what was that like for you to kind of see, you know, and that's now your friend, like what was that experience like? Well, for him to, to leave NWA, it was like I felt like I had an opportunity now because he pulled away from Easy and them. And now he's by himself, you know what I'm saying? He was starting the lynch mob, T-Bone, you know, right. JD. Um, JD, Shorty, man. Um, get well, Shorty, man. I hope you do good, man. I heard, you know, Shorty right. going through a situation and stuff. Um, but, um, you know, so I felt like I can cling on and get something out of it. So I wasn't begging for nothing. I just wanted to, like, every drug dealer or anybody in the streets doing anything, they want to take that and move into the business. Right. You know what I'm saying? Sports players want to be rappers. So I was just doing, playing my part, how it was going, you know what I mean? So 
he ended up sticking to his word. And Cube was like, like having me come around. They was doing what's that um, stuff with D. Barnes was hosting back then. Oh, pump it up. Pump it up. I used to right. be. At, they did it all at his mama house right there. You know, he was a mama's boy. He's lived right there for a long time. And then he put us on, bro. Got us in the studio. And then I can never forget this, bro. I wanted to say this, man. Um, that's when I met DJ Pooh, bro. Okay. <clears throat> DJ Pooh used to smoke a lot of weed. I, I never smoked weed. I never drink. Never smoked cigarettes. You know, I was like a just, just retarded in just my like brain. Me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was just with all the madness, just natural. I didn't have to be high nothing to to want to go here or go here. So DJ Pooh kept smoking weed, kept smoking weed. And I was like, man, you fucking weed head, man. Quit smoking all that weed up in the studio. <laughs> now Pooh was a skinny dude, man. You know and what I'm tall. saying? And yeah, tall for yeah. those that don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, about six four, six five. He called me outside, bro. And now you gotta remember, I was a solid dude at that time. Right. So called me outside by himself and he was like, hey man, look, I smoke my weed, bro. You know, I ain't trying to do nothing to bother you, but if you got a problem with it, we can get it on right now, homie. And, and, and I promise you, bro, anybody else would have did that in any kind of other way, we would have got to wherever <laughs> you want to go. But I had to just look at this dude, man, and come from my heart, how he hit me with it, and he was sincere with it. I was like, man, you know what? I apologize, bro. I was wrong. Hmm. You was right, bro. I shouldn't have called you out your name like that in front of everybody to try to take your manhood, like trying to punk you. And he was like, man, I'm from Watergate Crip, you know what I'm saying? And, I was like, what the fuck is Watergate Crip? <laughs> you know, I'm an East Side dude from out of right. Watts. I never knew the sets on the other side of Vermont but 111. Mm -hmm. That's all I knew. Okay. You know, so that's how me and DJ Pooh got so tight. And after that, man, we got to be the best of friends. And I'm here today, man, and my whole career is based off of what DJ Pooh did for me, dog. Yeah, because, you know, you've been in a lot of his films, like one of his less appreciated, but one I always really liked was Three Strikes. Yeah. Man. I thought yeah, that was man. good. Plus, it had a lot of the social commentary of what was going on in the law. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it was right on time. And I thought it was well done. It had a lot of really funny moments that balanced out the seriousness of what was going on. Similar to yeah. Friday. I don't think it was as funny as Friday, of course, but it definitely had a heavier subject matter as to like the, the back storyline. So for you, as you got to know and be around Pooh, like, what did you notice about him that made him different on the production and then also as a storyteller? Well, Pooh was always like, like, he, he had these, these, I don't want to say goofy, like all his tracks got this, 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 this banging, but it got a, a, com a comical beat to it. Okay. I don't know how to, I don't know how I'm trying to say it, but everything he do, he it's try to- only hard. Yeah, yeah he yeah. try to add the comic to it, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So. Everything. Well, he did a lot of that with King T, you know. He did it with King T. Um, coming out with King T, they had, you know, obviously they had a lot of stuff about drinking and smoking, but yeah. it was, you know, that added a little balance to what King T was doing. And yeah. Who yeah. obviously produced the majority of that early stuff, so. Yeah, poor legend, man. I remember sitting on the plane next to Q, man. We was going to London or coming. I think we were going. Mm -hmm. And we were on tour. It was me and Cam Cube and the Lynch Mob, and we were going to London. This was back in 90. 1990, bro, and me and Q was sitting side by side to each other, and I remember him showing me stuff that Pooh was writing for the movie Friday. Mm. Pooh was actually like writing the 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 Chris Tucker role like as his role. Oh, okay. I think uh, I'm not if I'm not mistaken, Pooh was gonna try to play a Chris Tucker role, you know, the mm. comical role like that. But I remember doing that with Q, man, and that's to let people know how far me and Q go back, man. You yeah, know. Yeah. People took a lot of what happened with us, you know, like it was something like random, or something. random, bro. But I've been knowing that guy for a long time, bro. Well, as far as the, you know, your beef and, and situation with Cube, you know, now looking back on it, how do you think you learned from it? How did you repair your guys' relationship? How did you kind of like move past it? Well, it's nothing I learned from it. Okay. I mean, because <laughs> it's just hood shit that happened. You know, people that's that's not hood and not in the streets like I was at that time, bro, took it like, oh shit, you just beat the Don Mecca up. You just robbed the Don Mecca. You just did this to the Don Mecca because people look at Cube as, you know, the he's the gangster. Right. Like, you better watch out. No, he better watch out. That's how it was <laughs> at that time, bro. Right. You know what I mean? And when that happened, when that incident happened with me and Cube, it was nothing to me. That's just, it fell into what you do as being in the streets at that time. That's just me. If I, if I, me and you get into a fucking fight and we scrapping, bro, and something on you I need, that's just how it was going, bro. Right. 
you know, that's what happens. You know, you still see that to this day. Fight, jump off, dude, get out the bottom of the pile. Where my watch at? Where my necklace at? Where did, that's just how stuff was, bro. Right. So, you know, people took it crazy and stuff. But me and Q, we kind of hammered that down. You know, Mac-10 intervened in the middle of it mm -hmm. and try to um, squash it because I was just going everywhere with the chain on and was daring anybody to do anything. You know, it's a lot of stuff that people don't know that when, you know, I went to his neighborhood and told everybody in his neighborhood, bro, this true story, man, he can have his chain back. And I used to wear it all the time and didn't worry about nobody taking it from me. <laughs> and I was like, he can have his chain back, bro, as long as he, he come back and fight me again. Mm -hmm. But Q just was like, nah, man, we're going to let that let, let that, that ride. ride, you know what I mean? Right. So Mac-10 orchestrated the deal. I give Mac-10 Mac a chain. Mac-10 tell me he going to get me all this stuff. He going to give me this. And it took too long to where I start pressing Mac-10. Like, well, you better get my fucking chain back. Mm -hmm. And he was like, man, Solo, that, it wasn't yours from the jump, bro. Get my chain back or give me yours. It's going to happen one way or the other. I'm going to get my <laughs> W back, bro. So um, I ended up getting paid. Mac-10 ended up taking care of me, making sure shit was straight. Then me and Cube ended up sitting down, man. Mm -hmm. Man to man, sitting down. He was filming the Jamie Foxx show and uh, Players Club at the time. And he okay. had these black eyes. Because I didn't know I did him that bad because I spassed out. Mm -hmm. And he had these big black glasses on. And I can remember us sitting in Jerry's Deli and he was just shaking the whole table while he was sitting there with me. And I was like, dude, calm down, man. I know you, bro. Right. We ain't got to go through all this, man. Let's just figure some things out. So he was inviting me to Laker game. He just wanted to make it a bond even tighter. Mm -hmm. But my loyalty to Cam was, was worth more than signing and make more money. Now, should I have thought about, you know, things back then? Because Q was laying it. When I tell you he was laying it out for me, bro, he was laying it out. <laughs> calling mm -hmm. me to come to studios, Larrabee Studios. Man, Solo, I'm going to make you this. I'm going to make you in charge of that. And I was like, nah. Take care of Cam, man. But I didn't know all the while I was saying take care of Cam because certain things that Cam was doing financially wise, I didn't understand. You know, they okay. was beefing over taxes. Right, right. Taxes getting paid. I didn't have no knowledge of that. I just thought the man owed the man some bread. Mm -hmm. So this my dude, bro. Give him his money. Right, right. Are we gonna keep this process going? It's gonna keep. We gonna keep getting pressed. Mm -hmm. So. We end up squashing it though, man. And I ran into him, man, and um, at um, that crazy tune, rest in peace, man. His funeral, right. and me and Cube hug. We talk, man, and he was like, you know, you can feel the sincereness because Kibo always kept us in touch with each other. I don't okay. know if you know Big Kibo, yeah, yeah, yeah. man. That's my dude right there, man. You know, so Kibo came home, and I thought it was gonna be a problem because he was looking for me. Okay. He he wanted to know who who is solo. I need to holler at this dude. Mm -hmm. So when I finally seen this big old buff Hulk Hogan, <laughs> um, Hulk dude right. come looking for me and I get out the car and he right there, but he was cool. Man, I just want to tell you, homie, you know what I'm saying? We don't got no problem. Right. You know, Q hiring us and blah, blah, blah. Just want to thank you that you kept it real and that was it. That's a beautiful thing.